In this clip I will provide a proof of the intermediate value theorem. Well, it's a rather elegant proof using monotonic convergence of certain sequences. Look at the following picture. So, assume we have a continuous function f, f a is smaller than f b and we take some value c in between f a and f b. We need to show that there is an x in between a and b such that f of x equals the value c. What we do is consider the midpoint of the interval a b, so which will be a half times a plus b, and then we start with the interval a b <coughs> and consider the midpoint and look at the value of the midpoint in this interval then we will create a new interval a2 b2 and since the value in a half times a plus b is still smaller than c then we shift a1 to a2 so the old value a is changed and we take as a new value on the left hand side the left hand side of the interval as a2 again we specify the midpoint of a2 b2 and compare the function value there it turns out to be larger than c and then we shift the right end point of the interval so we maintain the same left point so a2 equals a3 but b2 changes into b3 so we have the following procedure of constructing intervals a k b k where we start with the interval a1 b1 is just a b now as a first step we start with the interval a1 b1 equals a b And secondly, we look at the midpoint, x equals a half times a1 plus b1, and compare it with the value c. Yeah, the function value in fx, if x, fx is larger than c, then we move the right hand point. So then a2 equals a1, and b2 equals x the new midpoint is x so the reason why we do this is that we move the right hand point towards the left we get an interval of half the size but still c is in, in between the, the function value in the left hand point and the right hand point well if fx happens to be smaller than c then we shift the left hand point so a2 is x and b2 equals b1 now suppose we have strict inequalities here then we may continue again we choose the midpoint of the new interval a2 b2 which is a half times a2 plus b2 and we do the same thing. So if fx is larger than c, then we move the right hand point. So a3 equals a2 and b3 equals x. And if x turns out to be smaller than c, then we move the left hand point. So a3 is the new value x and b3 is still the same, which equals b2, etc. So we have the intervals at each step the length of the interval is decreasing strictly decreasing and c is in the, still in the middle so we 
forgot about one scenario. So what if by chance we would find an x such that fx equals c for some step? Well, actually, then we're done, right? So we were looking for a value x such that fx would equal c. So then we may congratulate ourselves and we're done. But what if we're not so lucky? Which is usually the case. What if we're not so lucky? Then we defined actually sequences a n and b n. Yes, we define the sequences a n and b n, and as you can see by construction, the set of elements in the sequence a n is monotonically increasing, and the set of yeah, so which means that a n plus one is at least a n for all n. And we also have that a n is always smaller, or at least uh, uh, at most b n. So a n, by construction, a n is always smaller equal b n. So that a n is actually a bounded sequence, right? Well, something similar holds for Bn, only now it's not a monotonically increasing sequence, but it's a monotonically decreasing sequence. So that for all indices Bn plus 1, all indices n, we have Bn plus 1 is smaller or equal Bn for all n. Also, we know that Bn is always at least a yeah, Bn is always on the right hand side of A by construction. So also we have a bounded sequence Bn. But now we may apply the monotonic convergence theorem for sequences. Yeah, what did the monotonic convergence theorem uh, say about? Uh, sequences well if a sequence is bounded and monotonically increasing or decreasing then it must be convergent so actually a n and b n are convergent the typical thing here is that a n and b n are convergent and they have the same limit well, why would that be well this is a question that's meant for you, so try to solve it. Give a reason why they should have the same limit. Now we may call D the limit of AN and the limit of BN. Yeah, since the limit of AN and BN is the same, we just name it D f is a continuous function, so if we calculate the limit of the sequence of elements f, a, n, now the limit for n to infinity, f, a, n uh, equals the limit of n to infinity, f, b, n, which is f of d by the direct substitution property for continuous functions. Also, we have the following, f a n, yeah, since we assume that we're not lucky to find, find an exact value c along the way, we know that f a n is always smaller than c, and f b n is always larger than c, for all n. Well, then it must hold that the limit for n to infinity of f a n 
if all elements f a n are smaller than c, then the, then it, the limit of the sequence can be at most c, cannot exceed c. And the same thing holds for the sequence f b n, it should be at least c. But now use that on the left hand side of this uh, and this inequality we see f of d and on the right hand side we see f of d so since c is in between f d and f d we must have that f d equals c so actually we found an x namely x equals to uh, equal d such that fd fx equals c which is what we needed to prove